Greetings, I'm John Ellis, and I'm happy to discuss with you today issues in anesthesia for major abdominal cancer resection. I'm adjunct professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at the University of Pennsylvania. You will notice here at the bottom of the page a URL, and if you write this down, if you get that URL, you will be able to get all of the slides that I present here in this talk. I want to thank Dr. Vivek Moitra, who's on the right here. I'm on the left. Dr. Moitra is a former resident of mine, and we have worked on some of this presentation together. My conflict of interest statement, I do work with Baxter. Uh, they make volatile anesthetics, so you can take that uh, as my conflict of interest statement. There are a number of operations we could talk about uh, in terms of abdominal cancer operations uh, to be considered, but particularly during this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, hepatic resection, often for metastases, uh, and also esophagectomy for cancer. Now, if we think about these patients preoperatively, we know that many of them are elderly, and even if not, they may have significant medical comorbidity uh, from chronic conditions as well as from their cancer. Uh, in fact, there's a very nice uh, review article uh, in the Brazilian literature uh, about planning uh, in the preoperative period before hepatectomy. And what we note here is very high rates of complication. This study, 45% rates of complication. Half of them were infectious. Most common infections were liver and bile ducts, closely followed by the lung. Mortality of 3.1%. And you see here that infections are counted for almost half of the causes of death. If we look at this series of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Registry in the United States, we see that the predictors of mortality after uh, esophagectomy include advanced age, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, advanced American Society of Anesthesiologists status and the use of steroids. Now one thing we know is that surgeons and hospitals that do more of these procedures have better results. They have lower mortality rates and they have fewer complications. And this is even more so for cancer operations than it is for cardiovascular operations. And this study is from a few years ago, but we see here that as surgeons do more gastrectomies, perform more esophagectomies, or perform more pancreatic resections, the mortality rate goes down. So practice seems to make perfect. What have we seen recently in terms of our surgical approaches? Well, one is the use of uh, laparoscopic and less invasive approaches, in some cases uh, involving the use of robotic surgery. And one of the questions is, does this result in better outcomes for patients? Let's look at a little bit of this. Uh, I recommend a video to you uh, if you want to see uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery uh, for hepatic resection, you can see this at the URL at the top of the screen. This is actually a wonderful uh, resource on the web uh, for viewing non-invasive uh, operations. Now, these less invasive, I won't even call them minimally invasive approaches, are able to reduce surgical trauma to some extent. This is just showing the difference between a conventional esophagectomy and a thoracoscopic esophagectomy. But there still are significant incisions, number one. And number two, remember that there is still extensive internal dissection. And so while we might hope that these less invasive procedures will produce less pain and quicker recovery, that is not necessarily a given. I found it uh, to great joy to watch a video uh, that's associated with this article. Uh, and these surgeons describe doing a minimally invasive uh, esophagectomy, where they first start out by doing a supine abdominal laparoscopy. They then turn the patient prone to do a thoracoscopic mobilization of the esophagus and then turn the patient supine again to complete the abdominal laparoscopy and finally perform a fan and steel incision to remove uh, the specimen. So this is a lot of work for the anesthesiologist uh, to constantly be repositioning the patient. If we look at this one review here, this is actually a study, they concluded that minimally invasive techniques 
were safe and comparable to open approach with respect to postoperative recovery and cancer survival, with somewhat less estimated blood loss, ICU stay, and hospital length of stay. Safe and comparable. So it is not always clear that these represent tremendous uh, outcomes improvements for patients. So when we're in the operating room with these patients, there are a number of challenges that we may face. And some of these are hemodynamic adventures or misadventures. These can occur because of peritoneal insufflation, compression of the uh, vena cava, uh, caval tumors may result in some cases, uh, hemorrhage, and air embolism. And we'll particularly talk about uh, air embolism in the rest of this talk. So the big question for us is, can anesthetic management reduce complications and improve outcome? And I think there are a number of ways in, what, in which what we do can improve patient outcome. Uh, number one is avoiding transfusion when not necessary. Number two is maintaining vital organ perfusion. And number three is providing effective analgesia to minimize stress responses and also to minimize respiratory complications. Let's talk first about fluid management. And we'll talk about a variety of overlapping but somewhat different aspects. And a lot of these will focus on management of patients undergoing hepatic resection. First, we'll talk about normal volemic hemodilution for hepatic resection, which is sometimes done in conjunction with low CVP techniques for hepatic resection. They are not one and the same. In these patients undergoing major cancer operation, there may be outcome benefits from goal-directed fluid resuscitation. I won't really talk much about the controversies of colloid versus crystalloid, although we will look a little bit about how one might monitor the adequacy of fluid resuscitation. Normal volemic hemodilution. Here the idea is that you take blood off of a patient whole blood in the operating room and replace it with colloid and or crystalloid and have the patient be normal volemic but have a lower hematocrit so that shed blood is lower in hemoglobin concentration. And here is a study from Germany that suggests that when you do this, you are significantly able to reduce the amount of transfusion uh, in a randomized trial. You see here the number of patients who have no uh, units of blood transfused is increased with the use of normal volemic hemodilution. How does one do this? Uh, you see here in this example with CVP monitoring, this comes down. There's some increase in blood pressure here as the surgical stimulus uh, begins. And this is essentially uh, a goal for keeping the CVP approximately in the 5 range, although uh, we see here at this point that it's 9, and that might be considered a little high. Now you have to realize that not everyone is a candidate for this low uh, CVP or even normal volemic hemodilution technique. This is a patient uh, with certainly an enlarged heart uh, in whom we tried to do uh, some normal volemic hemodilution at the surgeon's request, but we were not able to do that successfully. She became hypotensive quickly, and as you can see, she's very dependent on having a good filling pressure in order to have good cardiac function. Now, why was this surgeon so fixated on avoiding transfusion? And a lot of this, and you've heard about this some, are about concerns that blood transfusion is immunosuppressive and may increase uh, tumor recurrence after surgery. We've heard about this earlier today. Does transfusion promote metastasis? Uh, there's some question about that. There may be some immunomodulatory effects of uh, pack cells or other blood product transfusion. This appears to be the case even uh, with leuco-reduced uh, blood products. Now, one of the goals of low CVP, which is can be done with normal volemic hemodilution or not, is to soften the liver. The idea is to lower the CVP, have a soft liver, have a vena cava that is not uh, distended. It makes it supposedly easier for surgeons to mobilize the liver and dissect the hepatic veins, reduce hepatic venous bleeding, facilitate control of inadvertent venous injury, and all of these are designed hopefully to reduce blood loss during hepatic surgery. The uh, team at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York uh, has written about this extensively. Uh, and these papers are several years old, but they describe their technique. Uh, 
with fluid restriction, several large bore IVs. Uh, this was written some years ago using isofluorine and oxygen and fentanyl. And they would give morphine or nitroglycerin as necessary to get the central venous pressure less than 5 millimeters of mercury. Now one of the questions is, is if you fluid restrict these patients during this major surgery, do you put them at risk of having renal or gut uh, or other hypoperfusion. Uh, in this article, they suggest that only 3% of patients had an increase of creatinine associated with the technique, and they thought that it was safe. And I suppose the argument is that a relatively short one or two hour period of some hypoperfusion uh, may be worth the risk rather than having a patient need a transfusion. But there are some caveats with the use of low CVP techniques. Uh, number one is that after the dissection is complete, it's probably necessary to hydrate patients gently to restore them to normal uh, volume status. And remember this, if the surgeons apply a caval clamp, there will be very little return to the heart, in which case you will need to shift gears and then give fluid and give fluid rapidly. Another issue that may occur, particularly with low CVP techniques, is venous air embolism. That makes the gradient larger to permit venous air embolism if the CVP is low, and that is even more likely to happen during laparoscopic surgery. So many clinicians would choose not to use nitrous oxide uh, during uh, these procedures so as to minimize the size of any venous air emboli. In point of fact, in animal studies, you see that venous air embolus is almost universal uh, during laparoscopic hepatectomy, uh, although not usually of a clinically significant amount. We also see here one can use transesophageal echocardiography to detect a fair number of patients who have a significant amount of venous air embolism, particularly when ultrasonic surgical aspirator devices are used. Now, recent work has questioned whether or not these low CVP techniques are e actually even effective. And here is one retrospective study in patients uh, undergoing donor hepatectomy. So these are healthy livers giving liver for tr uh, a transplant. And we see here that although they show that this is, uh, here's the correlation coefficient, we see there's not a tremendous uh, relationship here between the mean CVP and blood loss, although we see that uh, there was only one patient who was allowed to have a CVP of greater than 10. Here's another study uh, from Korea, and this is in a study of almost a thousand patients. And we really see here there's no significant uh, difference uh, between the blood loss dependent on what the CVP is in any individual patient. So this would suggest that low CVP techniques may not have the benefit that we've thought that they have had. Well, back to this question, if patients are becoming hypovolemic, either intentionally uh, to try to soften the liver or inadvertently, uh, will this produce vital organ dysfunction? Uh, liver uh, ischemia, uh, gut ischemia, uh, less than optimal perfusion of the kidneys. So there have been a number of studies of goal-directed therapy that have suggested that when one uses goal-directed therapy, you can have improvements of outcome. This study from Duke University was done in 100 major elective surgery patients in which more than 500 milliliters of blood loss was expected. Many of these were abdominal cancer operations. And they actually did goal-directed fluid therapy by measuring stroke volume with an esophageal Doppler monitor. And in this study, they found that the patients who had goal-directed therapy spent fewer days in the hospital, and this seemed to be an indication of better gut function and that they were able to eat food earlier after surgery than patients in conventional fluid therapy. There have been any number of studies that have suggested that goal-directed therapy uh, after or during major surgery may reduce complications uh, and reduce uh, duration of hospital stay. One of the problems with some of these studies is that many of them have been done by investigators who are using devices from industry uh, and they may be conflicted as a result.
Uh, nonetheless, if we look, for example, at this one study by Rupert Pierce, they randomized patients having two or more of these risk factors before, and one of these risk factors was disseminated malignancy, and they found that early goal-directed therapy significantly reduced hospital stay in these patients. As I mentioned at the introduction, I will not spend a lot of time uh, debating uh, crystalloid versus colloid. It was very interesting hearing a discussion uh, at the World Congress of Anesthesiologists wherein uh, it appears that the North Americans are outliers in their heavy use of crystalloid and that many around the rest of the world tend to use more colloid without really clear differences in outcomes in patients. Having said that, and talking about goal-directed therapy, on the other hand, there have been studies that suggest that limiting fluids may have benefits, and particularly from a pulmonary complication. Here is one randomized trial in patients undergoing abdominal cancer operation. I believe these were colon resections. And you actually see here that cardiopulmonary complications were reduced in a fluid-restricted group compared to a standard group. So now we're left with somewhat conflicting uh, information. Clearly, goal-directed therapy does not mean giving too much fluid, but here we have another study that suggests that fluid restriction uh, may be a benefit. And I think from a clinical perspective, this may depend in part on what one thinks the more likely complications a patient is to have. If someone has bad lungs, I would probably treat them uh, less aggressively with fluid. Uh, if they have bad kidneys, perhaps more aggressively with fluid, but that's just a personal judgment. I mentioned that one of the reasons for re reducing fluid administration is the attempt to reduce postoperative ventilation. There are any number of reasons why this may happen. Patients may have underlying cardiopulmonary disease. They may receive large fluid volumes, and this particularly may cause a problem if they uh, cause airway edema, particularly if patients are in a head down or Trendelenburg position. Transfusion and associated lung injury may happen. Uh, visceral edema uh, may make uh, mechanical ventilation or spontaneous ventilation for that matter more difficult. The systemic inflammatory response and pain and splinting can all go into producing uh, pulmonary complications and the need for postoperative ventilation. Uh, this is a series of patients undergoing esophagectomy uh, from the Massachusetts General uh, just to give a sense of the level of complications in these patients. And we see 15% of the patients have pneumonia, 3% have uh, ARDS, postoperative arrhythmia is 15%, and a 2% 30-day mortality. Now, one of the things in their studies, you see that these are patients uh, who had fairly long operations, receiving 6 liters of crystalloid. Remember I mentioned the affinity for crystalloid in the United States, a small amount of colloid, not very much blood loss. Few of the patients were transfused for the reasons we discussed earlier, but note, almost all of these patients receive a thoracic epidural. We'll talk about those more later in the talk. And in this series, they extubated 90% of their patients in the OR. There are a number of retrospective studies that suggest extubating patients after a esophagectomy in the OR is actually associated with less respiratory complication than prophylactic ventilation overnight. And indeed, of these 92 patients, only three subsequently required reintubation. Ten patients were sent to the ICU with an endotracheal tube, and of those, two had been patients who had been extubated initially in the OR, but then were reintubated because of acute airway uh, obstruction. So only 5% of these patients required reintubation. So let's talk a little bit more about respiratory failure after abdominal surgery and potential approaches uh, to limit those complications. Uh, number one is that non-invasive ventilation with CPAP may be effective in reducing pulmonary complications. Uh, in this randomized trial from Italy, uh, they studied patients who had undergone laparotomy in the postoperative period. 17% of those patients were hypoxemic, and they were randomized to receive either conventional therapy or CPAP. And what we see here is the patients who got CPAP were far less likely to subsequently require intubation over the next several days compared to patients in the control group. It has also been shown in a retrospective study that physical therapy can 
be associated with reductions in pleural effusions, atelectasis, pneumonia, and total respiratory complications. So good analgesia may be effective. Pulmonary physiotherapy may also be effective in reducing pulmonary complications. We believe that good analgesia improves outcomes after major surgery. Hopefully our patients do not look like this after uh, their major surgery. There is certainly a lot of literature. This is just one article that I choose to point out. And this is a randomized study of adding thoracic epidural uh, bupivacaine to intrathecal morphine. All of the patients in the study received intrathecal morphine, half received in addition thoracic epidural bupivacaine, and the others received uh, a placebo uh, in the epidural. And what you see here is morphine consumption is lower in the patients who had the bupivacaine epidural added to the intrathecal morphine, and they found similar results in looking at pain scores. Now we've heard about issues of perioperative immunology and metastasis, and there's a balance between providing good uh, blockade of immune uh, function uh, and, and surgical stress, uh, if poorly controlled, may actually make it easier uh, to have metastatic cells escape, whereas other uh, uh, facets of immunology may be more effective in terms of limiting uh, the ability of metastasis to occur and to allow the body's own uh, immunology to function. This review by Kurosawa suggests that a number of things that happen in the perioperative period, including inflammation, uh, the stress response, hypotension, hypothermia, hyperglycemia, blood transfusion, may cause patients becoming immunosuppressed. But in addition, some of our anesthetics, volatile anesthetics and morphine in particular, also appear to be immunosuppressive. On the other hand, they suggest that there are a number of drugs and techniques that may actually support uh, immune function in the perioperative period, including the use of propofol, COX-2 inhibitors, the use of regional anesthetics such as peripheral nerve blocks, and perhaps beta blockers as well have been suggested to have positive effects on immune modulation. Uh, having said that, when we look at actual randomized studies of outcome, it is not necessarily clear that the choice of general anesthetic matters. While propofol has been suggested to be better supportive uh, of the uh, immune function and also to be a free radical scavenger, in point of fact, we see a randomized study here that suggests that when patients are given propofol, then sevoflurane preconditioning before uh, causing liver ischemia, there's actually less, less release of uh, serum transaminases. We see here that the preconditioning before ischemia patients actually have lower levels of transaminases than the patients who did not have preconditioning. So it's not clear to me that there is one technique uh, as far as general anesthesia that can improve outcome in these patients. Now, some caveats about thoracic epidurals. We see that local anesthetics provide superior analgesia, but they can cause a number of problems, hypoperfusion of the liver and an esophagectomy of esophageal anastomoses. Another concern is coagulopathy. Changes in coagulation status are normal after hepatectomy, and then that creates problems as to when to choose to remove an indwelling epidural catheter. For example, in this study, we see here, looking at mean arterial pressure in the blue, this is pre-epidural, epidural. You see that the mean arterial pressure falls. It can be restored with norepinephrine. But now look at this. They actually measure blood flow inside the middle hepatic vein using Doppler echocardiography. Epidural causes the hepatic vein flow to fall, but restoring blood pressure with norepinephrine actually causes hepatic blood flow to decrease even more. So just giving vasopressors may or may not restore tissue flow. This is not something that we would normally measure. Normally we would be happy having given the norepinephrine to see an increase in blood pressure. We don't necessarily know what's happening uh, at the tissue level. 
Again, another study here showing uh, that thoracic epidural uh, administration may reduce blood flow at the anastomotic end of an esophagogastrectomy anastomosis, and yet uh, giving some adrenaline or epinephrine may restore uh, some of that uh, flow uh, compared to what the decreases are seen uh, at giving the dosing the epidural with local anesthetic. And here, just to show you that in patients who are undergoing hepatectomy, that it is fairly normal on postoperative day one to have an elevation in the INR, and even after five days for it to still be increased over normal. And so one would imagine that you might want to leave this epidural in uh, on average at least for three days uh, before pulling it. And some people, therefore, might like to just use a single shot uh, spinal opiate, but again, that only provides 24 hours of analgesia. And as we've seen, uh, it does not do as uh, give as effective pain relief as local anesthetics do in the epidural space. If we look at this from a population level, uh, the group in Toronto and Canada looked at 44,000 uh, cases uh, of, of major surgery with and without epidurals, and they actually found that epidurals did reduce 30-day mortality. Because it was such a large number of patients studied retrospectively, the difference was significant, okay? But the number of patients needed to treat was very large approaching 500 patients. You, that means you would have to do 500 epidurals to prevent one death. And some would argue that that's a very high number needed to treat. However, I would submit to you that when I need to have my esophagectomy or hepatectomy, I certainly would like to have a thoracic epidural if for no other reason than the benefits in terms of increased pain relief. Some researchers have looked at other techniques of analgesia in part because of these concerns about uh, neuraxial catheters and coagulation status. And here's a randomized trial uh, comparing ultrasound guided uh, transversus abdominis plane blocks, tap blocks, with uh, traditional thoracic uh, epidural after uh, upper abdominal surgery. And you see here that the, uh, the, the, the pain scores uh, during coughing are very similar. There are no significant differences. At rest, there's only one significant point at 24 hours when there's a difference, and it's pretty small. And so when you look at this, this would suggest that this may be an effective alternative uh, to use a tap lock as opposed, and actually these patients had catheters, as opposed to using continuous epidural analgesia. So in conclusion, these patients undergoing major abdominal surgery for cancer have a high mortality. I showed you a slide early on that suggested 5 to 10 percent mortality for many of these operations. Although it's not so apparent to us if we work just in the operating room because many times these deaths occur after some prolonged period of time of pneumonia, ARDS, multi-system organ failure. Uh, I believe that anesthetic technique, particularly a good uh, analgesia uh, with uh, neuraxial and or peripheral nerve blocks, uh, may improve outcome. Appropriate fluid resuscitation without giving too much fluid may improve outcome. There are some studies to suggest that early extubation uh, may reduce pulmonary complications, particularly in patients undergoing esophagectomy. And I believe that multimodal analgesia techniques uh, may be beneficial, not only improving patients' outcome in the short term and providing the ability to fast track, uh, but potentially providing Im improved analgesia reducing stress responses, and maybe even reducing the likelihood of respiratory complications and subsequent recurrence of cancer during long-term follow-up. I thank you very much. And once again, if you look at this URL here at the bottom of the screen, you may download all of these slides. Thank you very, very much for your attention.